This course is specifically designed and developed for solution architects, system analysts and business analysts, developers, enterprise architect, project managers and above. Since we will be trying to cover in this uh, entire course about why we need a cloud foundry, what is cloud foundry? So it is definitely useful for uh, I'll say project managers and architects system analyst and business analyst to understand what exactly is the cloud foundry and from the developers perspective who wanted to deep dive into the cloud foundry we will be exploring multiple features and uh, deployment strategies ways of cloud foundry which is specifically meant for uh, developers but again these courses consist initial part consists of uh, to answer to give you an answer about what and why and uh, in the in the remaining portion we will be trying to cover about how to use cloud foundry okay as i mentioned earlier um, that i have divided the course into two parts where i'll be specifically just talking about serverless architecture and in serverless architecture i'm going to cover about what is serverless? What does it mean actually? And uh, why exactly we need serverless architecture? I will be briefly covering how it is different as compared to your infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and function as a service, paper event. Okay, so um, it's how uh, different ways of uh, infrastructure implementations. Um, we have it what are the different ways and how where serverless fits into it i'll be briefly talking about what are the advantages of the serverless architecture and last but not the least high level architecture about sample program which we will be standing up so so he, i i just wanted to in this topic uh, i just wanted to tell you is that we are uh, I would just don't want it to first part of the course to be restricted only towards the AWS, but uh, but an overall overall I want you to understand what is serverless. Then second topic where uh, we'll be quickly going towards uh, more towards the AWS specific where we will be I will be talking about how to set up an AWS account, what is a S3 bucket and how to set up how to set up a key in Eclipse. Since this entire implementation, I'm going to do it in Java. I'll be talking about uh, key setup in Eclipse, which plugin you need it, set up an IAM role and how to set up, and what is AWS Lambda and how to set up actually. These are the some of the initial steps which we have to do it before we go for AWS uh, Lambda or where we were trying to deploy our code. I will be briefly touching about the API gateway also. So beyond serverless, how you can protect your endpoints also. How the throttling works and uh, uh, towards the end, we will be talking about DynamoDB, okay? Because uh, it really doesn't make much sense to have a service uh, which doesn't persist any data or a user cannot um, retrieve any data. So we will be definitely talking about the DynamoDB also and uh, whatever application we are going to develop uh, in the first part at the end we will be integrating with dynamodb so i'm not briefly going I'm, I'm just briefly going to talk about java code but not in detail you can prefer to have any other implementation i'll be putting the course uh, uh, the code for this exercise uh, uh, in the description also uh, which is uh, on the git so you guys can free, uh, freely access it and implement it on your own. So not necessarily you do have to have a Java knowledge, but um, if you have it, it will be more uh, meaningful what I, how it is implemented and all. But again, as I said, uh, it's not restricted to Java and I'm not going to talk too much about um, how to implement in java it is just i wanted to show one way of implementation but again there are multiple ways you can implement the um, 
lambda functions and uh, there are multiple packages available also so these are the topics i am going to cover and uh, i hope uh, you are going to get out of this topic what you are looking for and um, i hope um, you will get almost all the uh, information which needed for uh, your serverless uh, uh, implementation so stay tuned and uh, let's get started with the topic so guys i am adding two more bonus uh, topics one is about what are the shortcomings what are the issues with serverless architecture because um, you when i said that there are a lot of advantages of it then why not everybody can use it and why not in everybody started using it there are certain um, certain shortcomings are there which uh, you should be aware before you start implementing it and at the same time in aws how the cost works i will be talking about it both the topics i have added at the end of the our session uh, because uh, both the topics need a clear understanding and implementation of uh, of uh, lambda function so once you see that then you will be yourself will be aware of what i am going to talk about it so thank you all right coming to our first part which is what is serverless before we get into more about what is serverless let's try to understand the multiple infrastructure types which are available um, in currently in the industry okay and which if you are an experienced software the um, software engineer you would have seen uh, some of these um, at any point of your uh, career in software um, engineering so first and which is a quite a common is on premises okay uh, where in this um, in this kind of infrastructure type uh, um, you take care of networking storage server virtualization of them if you on the same server you are looking for multiple uh, application uh, application and operating system i meant is uh, different different operating side uh, types if you are looking for then you will go for virtualization which is a vm operating systems you take care of it patching ab about them middleware components like uh, uh, your where you wanted to run it for example tomcat or weblogic or websphere okay you you take care of this at the same time you take care of the run times also what is the actual run time for your uh, applications uh, it's like uh, if you need a java or do you need a dot net those run times also you take care and you start um, updating patching uh, or upgrading those run time environments I mean, so you only manage them at the same time application and data definitely is yours so what do you can say that when you go for on premises you take care of all these things okay um where from bottom of the networking all the way till application also but when you go for infrastructure as a service you don't take care of like virtualization server storage and networking okay application data runtime middleware and operating system is something you take care of it and that is also an another offering you can see that aws uh, does it uh, google also does it and uh, amazon also does it most of the implementation falls into this area when somebody says that they are migrating onto the cloud is uh, use of ec2 um, if you go for um, uh, aws implementation that's where um, uh, is offering comes into the picture and uh, another if you go further these are basically in the is these are some of the layers you take care and rest of the layer somebody else is taking care of so that's the one of the advantage i will say that when you go from on premises to cloud where you don't have to take care of all these uh, layers actually which are uh, which are not in green okay but when you go further for pass offerings okay which is a platform as a service all you do is, is take care all you 
do is ma managing your application and data rest all is taken care by somebody else third party vendor for you but again you there are certain limitations there are certain pros and cons in each uh, infrastructure types because you have to stick with what runtimes they are giving it middleware os you don't have a freedom in choosing these areas so whatever is offered by that vendor you are going to use that so so how, how it is relevant to our serverless architecture so these things basically um, is a common practice till now okay but uh, um, but industry found it that something if we wanted to implement quickly and easily um, then serverless makes sense because i add this i don't want to take care of these layers also okay and uh, I also don't want it to go for pass offering also. So I need to find out something, uh, um, something, some solution where I have certain degree of control also on it. Uh, but at the same time, I don't need not to know uh, what are these underlying layers are there and who is taking care. I really don't care about it. I just wanted to uh, make choose my runtime and I wanted to where it gets executed which platform it gets executed i really don't care about it so so that kind of implementation i am uh, looking for so that's where industry went for um, which is a serverless architecture so how mostly in terms of uh, infrastructure as a service works actually so when you go for infrastructure as a service um, you take care of uh, vpc then you form the subnet then inside the subnets um, you go for uh, your VMs, uh, which is a EC2 instances, or in terms of any kind of virtual machines which you go for in cloud. And on top of that, you start installing your middleware components, runtimes, and uh, kind of load balancer, and then you start giving it to your end user. So that's typically an infrastructure as a service works. And uh, as I said, how the pass works is basically you don't have, you don't much, you take care of VPCs and subnets and rest all is like it comes as a bundled package like uh, Beanstalk instances uh, where you just uh, have to specify like which Tomcat version you need it and uh, what Java version you are looking for. And uh, that's how the pass uh, works actually. So over a period of time then industry gave a birth to a third uh, sorry fourth way of uh, of implementing this um, where um, which is a serverless architecture or called paper compute okay i means what exactly is the difference here is as compared to our three infrastructure types is you don't um, really know or you don't even take care of uh, underlying these uh, layers basically middleware oper uh, operating system virtualization server or storage or networking you don't even care about from where the compute power or uh, memory is um, coming all you get to choose is a runtime okay and uh, you can break it into smaller pieces also and you can then stitch them together also so your program major up, bigger application you can um, break it down into smaller pieces that's something called function as a service okay and uh, that's where that kind of gave a birth to serverless architecture where um, there are standalone services which you your multiple applications wanted to use it and uh, it really uh, need not to have much of a business uh, data or or uh, any uh, any much information or storage it doesn't need it it just tries to uh, do some activity for any application and tries to provide the results back like uh, for example i'm just giving you is you you are um, you are creating a function where it uh, does uh, some kind of um, i'll say image processing where 
it tries to um, reduce the size of the image you create that function and uh, you start calling it from multiple places of your um, kind of I will say bigger application uh, you try to call it and uh, you try to use it at multiple places this is really doesn't need too much of uh, uh, information actually we are business context or it's just a standalone um, function where you just wanted to use it at multiple places in the enterprise basically there are certain functionality which are not just you use it in the organization there are a lot of applications use it like suppose if you are into uh, credit card business you just wanted to do the validation uh, whether it is a valid uh, uh, card number okay this is something can be a, a function as a service where not everybody has to write you have to do the checksum and all check it whether it is a valid number or it is a active card and all you can have it as simple service which will just calculate and then and there itself it will tell you that okay this is the this is the right um, card and all uh, so those such services you can implement uh, as a function as a service and that kind of in going forward it gave a birth to a serverless architecture where underlying infrastructure you really need not to know and uh, this how this works is is uh, basically uh, it's like uh, wherever the compute uh, is uh, available in your um, vpc or in your subnet it tries to go access those uh, compute power or memory um, which is underutilized and uh, try to give you the results so it is a the architecture wise it is very beautiful and it it works for both of uh, both the vendors as well as the one who is implementing this course uh, implementing this uh, architecture basically function as a service so how it is beneficial is um, for me i don't care where it is running so all i need is end of the day is result okay and uh, for that job how much you are pay uh, how much i need to pay that's all i need to know i need not to stand up the infrastructure or uh, some of the things i need not to take care of underlying this here i have a program which i wanted to launch it make it available and uh, i i can completely um, abstract rest of the information which is irrelevant to me and i need not to be at the same time i need not to be expert in that area so this is how it helps and uh, this is the um, this is how it gave a birth to the uh, uh, serverless architecture now that we know what is serverless architecture let's see what are the advantages of serverless architecture implementation the first and foremost important thing is um, reduced operational cost since you are not taking care of underlying layers all you need to take care of is your uh, uh, your application and uh, just you need to deploy it and uh, make it available you don't have to worry about uh, uh, ec2 instance creation operating system selections you really don't have to take care of it or you don't have to manage it also reduced development cost okay so as you know that uh, on the enterprise most of the applications uh, uh, gets uh, deployed it um, through a ci cd platform you um, basically um, means you have a kind of pipeline which will go and deploy your enterprise application it will package it for you and uh, um, after packaging it will try to deploy it basically so here what happens is um, when you i will show you the actual practical example in terms of uh, lambda you will understand that there is really uh, uh, not much packaging is there okay on a single right click you can just uh, deploy the application from your workspace onto a lambda function and, uh, and you are done for the day and it is made available to the uh, rest of the whomever you are giving that service available you are making that service available to 
so it reduces uh, significantly your development cost also okay scaling cost okay since you don't have um, any underlying infrastructure okay um, the most of the serverless uh, implementations um, they offer you uh, I mean, with certain degree of uh, limitations but which is which you don't have to worry about it like for when i say limitations i meant is how many requests can come actually okay suppose your program um, is uh, or some service you are launching it and uh, it's used by millions of people you did not expect it so in that case in that scenario it's not your job to manage it that uh, oh it's accessed by billions of people and how i should scale it that's no longer a headache for you okay that is this is i must say that this is the one of the biggest advantage um, i have uh, seen in terms of serverless architecture uh, uh, implementation because scaling is the biggest thing you don't know your customers behavior lot of time um, if you are exposed externally or you are uh, exposing some of the service externally then you really don't have uh, idea about customer behavior and moreover there are a uh, lot of times um, the system is needed or the such services are needed only for uh, only during certain period of time like uh, festival seasons where you see that uh, the holiday seasons you see that there is a large um, degree of access to some of your services so such things uh, are internally taken care by most of the vendors who are in, who have implemented serverless architecture this is the uh, i must say that this is the one of the important uh, feature um, advantage uh, which serverless architecture offers reduce packaging and deployment cost as i said that uh, with the development it uh, reduces the uh, packaging and deployment cost also when I say reduce development cost, I meant is uh, basically not uh, too much. Uh, um, in, means in terms of coding, you have to do it. It's just you have to when you go for any um, implementation. It's just uh, you put a, a hook basically where your program extends um, some of the packages which AWS has provided, and uh, you just put a hook around it and like kind of starting off your program and uh, it starts getting executed from there so you don't have to worry about anything that's where um, i meant is uh, development cost you don't have to worry about like handling the uh, how the data is coming in how it is getting transformed into the objects it's everything is uh, readily available for you through the packages you just start using it and uh, um, extend it and start using it basically faster to market as uh, uh, operational cost is zero yeah it is almost to zero uh, there is not much development cost is there it's reduced significantly you don't need to have an active ci cd platform but again if you have it it's uh, that is good from the practice perspective but if something you wanted to test an mvp product uh, i must say that this is the actual uh, this is something you can test it out and uh, before you actually spend some time on to uh, developing a full-fledged product okay and uh, last thing is greener computing okay when I say greener computing as you you have seen in my previous uh, uh, diagram where I was showing you that the infrastructure drawn here is uh, is completely that this that information is abstracted from you okay so what how um, how internally um, the AWS or Google or Microsoft uh, or Oracle uh, they all have the serverless implementation how they might be managing it what they do it is wherever the servers are underutilized they try to carve out some compute from there okay and uh, they start running onto it so you don't have a standing infrastructure at any point of time that's what i meant is a greener computing 
most of the time you go for pass or ias or your uh, uh, on premises implementation you have a standing up infrastructure which is not the case in serverless architecture where you don't know where your program is going to run on which platform where it is uh, running with physically you don't really know that's why this name came uh, serverless architecture and uh, that's what serverless architecture means uh, it's uh, we can't take it literally of course there is a server server is uh, underlying where uh, you are where your program is running but it's uh, completely abstracted from you and you don't have to worry where it is working where it is running or not so these are the advantages of serverless architecture and um, i think well, yeah the use cases wise uh, um use cases wise we will talk into the next part so, but till then these are the advantages you need to keep in mind actually so now let's talk about our practical implementation which is uh, hands on also for serverless application implementation in aws using lambda okay so this is a high level architecture i'm not i have not included in this diagram each and everything but again we will as an as and when we will slowly progress we will um, we will learn we will add i will give you the explanation on it and uh, from there we will take it up so how how exactly um, it's going to get implemented and this is what it shows actually this picture depicts actually so you have your eclipse okay through which you will be pushing some code into s3 bucket at this moment you just have to understand that what is a s3 bucket is just a object storage okay since your lambda function is not running all the time all all the time it is not it's not available for you okay so it uh, stores your code application code into s3 bucket and it tries to take it from as and when needed from s3 bucket or as and when the request comes it uh, it uh, brings up the code from here it deploys on the lambda function and it tries to serve uh, your client request basically so that's that's the first part you need it need to have it then you need to have a lambda function okay and uh, further lambda functions uh, can be called through a cloud watch basically cloud watch is a is a is a aws offering of a kind of service where you can monitor your lambda function if you wanted to schedule some of the activities on your lambda function that also can be done through cloud watch and uh, another important part is this is about the compute part but what about the data storage part that we are going to do it through dynamo db okay so from eclipse we'll be pushing the code into the s3 bucket from s3 bucket it will get deployed into lambda okay lambda will be monitored how many requests came and all through cloud watch and uh, lambda will be accessing your dynamo db for storing and exchanging the data in between your kind of application or function uh, to you from your database and we are trying to expose this lambda over the internet through an api gateway okay api gateway is an another external way of um, is actually aws offering of uh, a kind of service where you can protect who is accessing your your service okay you can put a throttling around it you can there are a lot of uh, other functions which api gateway provides but we will try to have that integration where externally with a nice url it is exposed to the outside world uh, which is like your any end client so this is kind of overall architecture okay there are certain pieces which i am not going to talk about is uh, 
basically um aws is keep on revisiting uh, um lambda okay and uh, um the way i have seen it over 3 to 4 years of period of time um there are a lot of things they have added it okay the concerns related to customer uh, that i don't want that some data to be leaving my virtual private cloud i want that compute to happen somewhere where my vpc is there in a particular subnets so those things are come taken care um in recent past as well as uh, other storage devices are integrated like uh, efs and all so there are a lot of advancements they have made it but having said that i i'm for for today is apply whatever is applicable for us for our courses uh, these are the components which we will be talking about and these all are the things which we are going to do in the next uh, uh, from here onwards so this these things we are going to implement it so stay tuned for the next part where we will start with actually with the eclipse part and then we will go to the aws and then later list of the components in aws okay thank you so now this is our first topic towards the hands on which is uh, how to set up an aws account i'm not going to go too much deep into it but just uh, for those who are com completely new to the aws environment i'm just um, giving you the starting pointers so that uh, you can set up your um, uh, account this is uh, uh, this is something um, yes, i think uh, everybody can do it on their own but this is how uh, uh, i want you to start go on an uh, aws.amazon.com okay and uh, uh, create an aws account register yourself amazon gives uh, 12 months of free tier access so you really don't have to um worry for this exercise it will be a free only so provide your details continue it get the username and password uh, and uh, we'll try to log in next process ne next entire setup i will guide you through but uh, that's how you will be setting up your account actually so in this topic we will try to learn about what is s3 bucket and how to set up so s3 bucket is nothing but an object storage the when i say object storage um, you can store your files you can store your uh, programs images anything but it is uh, not associated with any of the vm or um ec2 instance basically so you can be practically you can access it over the internet from anywhere that's where most of the time people keep their st static websites also so s3 bucket is uh, it's a quite popular storage way in aws but again uh, there are different uh, use cases where uh, aws suggest which type of storage we should be using it for what purpose so uh, again for our purpose we are going to store our application code into that s3 bucket and uh, let's start with creating of an s3 bucket so once you log in into the uh, aws console you will get you will land onto this uh, console okay and here you have to search for the services as an s3 so i have already some of the s3 buckets but for our purpose we will try to create a new s3 bucket as i said earlier s3 bu buckets are avail accessible or objects are accessible over the internet so um, aws expects that we should be writing a unique name okay it should not collide with any other account holders so we have to make sure that uh, you are writing it um, a unique way so that it, 
there is nothing already existing with that name okay so we will give now the name my first lambda function ever i'm just trying to avoid uh, any other uh, conflict basically with any others uh, dns name it can be created in particular region so for now we are creating in a north virginia virginia region you can copy the settings of any of the existing bucket also like we have five buckets it's offering me that uh, we want to copy anything so you can go for that if you want it to otherwise you can leave it next since it is an object storage it can keep the multiple versions it's not like your um, normal storage which works on your c drive d drive or any unix drive or linux drive where you keep an uh, file over there and when you write it over there it gets uh, overwritten um, s3 works little bit different since it is an object storage it keeps the every time you update it it keeps an another copy actually in a different area so that's all it also maintains the versions also server access logging you can log the request uh, who has access it to the buckets also for our purpose let's keep the versioning okay tagging is something um, for identification purpose when the list starts growing it um, you need to identify who is doing it uh, what actually and if you wanted to uniquely pull the reports also it makes better sense to have a uh, tags added okay object level log logging if you wanted to do it it's an it comes at an additional cost you can do it in the cloud trail also okay default encryption since it is an publicly accessible storage you can make sure that it is encrypted you don't want even if it is accessible if somebody gets a hold of your object you can make sure it is encrypted also okay there are some more advanced settings okay permanently allow objects in this bucket to be locked um, if you just wanted to make sure that it is uh, all the time access it's just a uh, there are no more um, objects uh, allowed in this bucket it's like you keep it lock it and have it use it like your static website which you don't want anybody to be coming and changing it okay. next is configuration option this is where you tell whether you wanted to make it public or uh, publicly access or you wanted to keep it uh, safe with uh, protected with um, username and password that's where you can uh, you, you can specify the, these permissions there are multiple levels but again i'm not going to go too much deep into it but uh, this is just high level that by default it is not accessible to the public if you make it public it will ask you are you really aware that you wanted to make it public okay for for static website definitely you will make it but not all the time okay and then this is for me after permission this is your review branch let's see whether it can create it or not okay since we gave a quite a big name oh it accepted it my first lambda function ever test okay so this is the bucket we have created it we are not going to update it here we are programmatically going to update the objects into this s3 bucket so so this is all about um, s3 bucket again you can play around with it but for uh, this tutorial purpose this much is uh, sufficient basically so like um, again you can change it modify it there are there are a lot of other options also into s3 bucket where you can add the life cycle also you can like uh, change the storage after some time if it is not getting access and all so it works great um, you can explore it but again uh, for our purpose yeah this is uh, sufficient actually well, we have created an s3 bucket with this name and uh, let's go and uh, upload the object let's uh, let's go to our next topic where we will be learning about uh, how to set up an eclipse and in the eclipse we wanted to set up the um, 
AWS uh, toolkit also. So stay tuned for the next chapter. Thank you. So in this chapter, uh, we will try to learn how to set up the Eclipse and Eclipse keys. Okay. Basically, you need uh, um, two things which you can download it. Um, you can download uh, from eclipse.org uh, uh, Eclipse. Okay. I'll prefer a Luna um, because that's all I have. Uh, that's what I have set up uh, actually on my system. And AWS Toolkit actually. This is something accessible over the uh, um, uh, on the Eclipse side. So I will paste these links into um, it's actually in the next chapter um, at the bottom of this chapter. But uh, I just want you to keep in mind that install the Eclipse and install the plugin AWS Toolkit. If uh, I'll just quickly show that also from where it has to be installed and um, how you want to do, um, download the plugin. So you can click on the link which I have given at the bottom. Go on the that link, downloads, and download the version which uh, which is like uh, you can go for Eclipse ID for Java developers, or you can give for Eclipse ID for Java EE developers. I'll suggest you uh, download this one actually because it has um, J2E components also. So once you are done with that, now next comes is uh, um, downloading the AWS toolkit. Okay, so so once Eclipse is started up, you have to download the plugin, and that plugin is on this location. The URL is I have already pasted it. All you have to do is, is take it and dra drag it and drop it here. It will try to install that plugin. Once the plugin is installed, you will get the this kind of view where you can access all the Amazon EC2 code deploy Lambda functions. Everything you can access it from here. Okay, so so let me you know, once you are ready, let's move on to the next topic. That's where the real uh, fun starts begin. Okay, that's the only setup you need it. This is a one-time setup and uh, You don't have to do it again and again every time. So once you are set up you are set for at least on this system for a long long duration So in this chapter we will try to learn what is I am role and how to set up I am is nothing but identity and access management. This is one of the important um, one of the important, uh, uh, I must say, that service which uh, AWS offers. That's where the user setups happens and all the roles, uh, identity um, of the each user, what permissions they can have it. That entire setup happens into the IAM role. And how to do the setup? I'll uh, I'll show you in a couple of minutes. But um, for why we need for our purpose why we need an IAM is we need a, a user okay which we need to set up in our eclipse who will be having an access to deploy the code actually to deploy uh, have, who has an access to lambda also and who will be deploying the code through the eclipse so for that purpose we need an IAM so with that let's go to the IAM basically from our console so let's go I am is identity and access management users add a user let's create a lambda test user so what do you wanted to give an access to this user okay you wanted to give just a programmatic access programmatic access will give you access key id and secret access key okay so that you can access it from your eclipse 
you don't need to give the console access to this user because this is a programmatic uh, this user is going to access your application through programmatically so next is let's see so let's see what permissions we have to set up okay so set the permission create without a permissions boundary for now okay as i said i have a habit of creating the tags and let's create it at the organization level a lot of people will be working so it is the best practice to have your tagging properly there are a lot of advantages of having tagging you can identify the application billing resource groups uh, i know those are not uh, relevant for this topic but uh, tagging is one of the important thing and uh, you should enforce uh, tagging most of the places as an organization so okay the users have no permissions i think we have to go back and permission boundary is not set up so let's see create a group create a group add a user to the group or attach existing policies we'll give this user a lambda access okay this shows aws code deploy aws lambda basic execution rule or we can give a lambda full access for this purpose we will give so again you want to refine the access for that user you can do it if you don't wanted him to uh, deploy or something so that also you can do it i went to the existing attached policy tags i have already created preview aws lambda full access create the user okay once the user is created it will show you some of the details which you can copy it and uh, we can go here in eclipse preferences aws toolkit and you can copy your usernames and passwords here basically access key and secret access key here once you are done with that then we can take our uh, next step okay now in this chapter we'll try to learn what is the aws lambda and how to set up in the how to set up i'll be little bit talking about the code also and uh, how we can deploy it in into the aws lambda aws lambda is as i stated earlier it's an implementation of serverless architecture uh, by aws and that's what they call it lambda multiple vendors who offers the cloud services calls it with a different name but underlying the concept and architecture is serverless so let's get started with our eclipse setup uh, how we can deploy our code i'll quickly walk you through guys uh, through some of the code also so now I'm back to with your Eclipse. In the Eclipse, I have created basically three packages, which are main packages for our purpose. Uh, so for our um, so now we are in Eclipse. For this hands-on exercise, I have created three packages. Okay. First package is com dot such in dot lambda, which is just a simple lambda function, uh, which we will execute. It doesn't store any data, but it will just uh, just say hi. It will return a message. Second one is uh, with Dynamo DB, and there are supporting uh, beans actually, which I have kept it into this. Uh, um, I mean this package actually. So what exactly we are doing it into lambda request team handler stream handler okay we have um, we have imported the aws sdk okay so this one something you have to download it which will be uh, yeah so which 
after downloading you will be able to import these classes i'm keeping this code into um, git also i will provide the link at the bottom of this uh, this session so what we you can just download set up the eclipse or i am also creating a package which you can use it okay which you can just deploy it you don't need to go for this uh, eclipse setup also if you wanted to skip it that is perfectly fine for those who are interested they can go ahead so here i have created two uh, uh, imported two classes which are amazon classes and uh, here is what i am doing it okay one lambda request stream handler i have written it and i am implementing this interface which is provided by lambda uh, sorry by aws okay com.aws this is the package which we are uh, having it okay so so this one comes from this uh, basically lam uh, aws sdk so what i am doing is i am overriding this uh, method where i am just writing it onto the output stream hello all this is my first serverless program okay and uh, i'm just trying to push it onto the output stream and i will i will get to know what exactly it is uh, in return i am getting it also like it's a post request okay so let's try to deploy this method into lambda uh, lambda which is in aws we have done the secret key and all setup now we have to, to do deploy it okay upload the function to lambda okay you can run the functions on function on lambda also from your local machine that we will come later but before that let's upload the function to aws lambda also so it is asking me what should be the select the handler name I was talking very initially about certain hooks you put it. It will by default try to identify which are the main programs, which are the starting programs which needs to be used. So as I said, I am just uh, at this moment we will first test it out the um, our simple hello all pro program and later we will go for our second program where we will be deploying the Dynamo DB also. Okay. I am giving the name to this lambda function as a my function or my hello function. Since I gave the credential, it is downloading all my details here. Okay, uh, from our AWS account. So here you can see that this was something. If you remember, this something S3 bucket we have created. You can create the S3 buckets from here okay this is another op option um, from here uh, you can create your own s3 bucket okay i just wanted to give an overview of s3 so i have uh, that's why i went to the console and i tried to do it okay this is my first lambda function so I am trying to either use this role which is an existing or I can create a new role okay for this function role is nothing but what level of permissions it has what it is going to do it um, basic I am role that allows lambda function to call AWS services on your behalf okay so let's create a new role okay let's see what happens okay if you remember for the user which we configured in eclipse we only gave an access to only gave an access to only to lambda basically we did not give it to access to rest of the places try to have your program or the user set up in such a way um, where they have a limited access to the areas which they are really needed okay iam is a something a critical area so you should not give too much open access into iam area so 
this is one way of restricting to the developers or anybody in the uh, program who should have you know that what level of access you need it you can provide the access you have already also seen that lambda also has a restrictive level of access and for now i have given the full access okay so let's pick up which is an existing iam rule we will see what happens with that i i also don't know okay at this moment and i am giving the memory as a 5 12 and 15 timeout 15 if it is does not exist get executed in 15 minutes give me and uh, it will give you an error okay let's see whether it deploys or not okay so okay so uh, looks like we are lucky okay and let's go and in the console and let's go and check whether it deployed our lambda function or not okay See, we have deployed my hello function onto Lambda, okay. It deployed it, okay. And to large, no tags. This was the description we have added. Com, okay, timeout 15. All our enter setting came here, so which we did it through our eclipse okay so you can set up the vpc and all later but let's see um step by step we will take it up okay in this video what we will try to do is whatever function we have uploaded in during our last session through eclipse we'll try to test that okay some kind of unit test on the server so let's see let's do hello world test our program does not expect any input okay this is just by default template which uh, aws it provides for you we don't need it but again that is the most closest i find it and by default that's what it is offered so with that let's go and create it mm -hmm. once we created it let's see whether our program runs or not okay let's hope it runs successfully and all right it ran it without any issues so what was the output we were giving hello all this is my first serverless program so we have successfully deployed our program and ran it also so Hello, all. This is my first serverless program. If you wanted to do the second, we can do that also. But we need to re upload our program over there. So, AWS upload function, choose an existing my hello function because last time we did my first Lambda ever test. We'll see whether it gets deployed. It's taking time because it is making the connections and all. Now let's see whether it deployed on hello world program. We this time did second. Um, we made a change actually on our program. Let's see whether it got deployed or not. It will tell you when it deployed last time. Maximum age of an event, retry attempt to my functions. We can go back. So, our new program is already deployed. That is a 41 second cycle. Go here, let's try to run it. Test execution. This is my second serverless program. Voila, we are good. So here we have this is what we have done it small program we wrote it in eclipse deployed it through eclipse ran it here and tested it out okay 
we can test it locally also which we will show you when we are actually trying to deploy um, DynamoDB also with our application where we will be testing it locally also so let's meet in next chapter where we will be talking about DynamoDB in this chapter we will try to understand what is DynamoDB and how to set up in AWS console so before that I just wanted to give a brief overview of what is DynamoDB DynamoDB is a fully managed proprietary NoSQL database so it supports key value and document data structure this is a this is a proprietary as i said uh, amazon's product which is offered to um, aws customers now let us come back to our program okay what it will try to do is it will try to store information about me okay into uh, dynamo db so dynamo db is uh, where what we are doing is we are same class we are extending here we are telling that this is the table exist in dynamo db in this region okay and uh, locally how we can test it out i am trying to show you guys also okay so in this program what we are doing is i am going to make a connection to the dynamo db and we will start inserting the data also and we'll test it out that later okay so but programmatically what we are trying to do it is um, we are trying to insert some of the data into dynamo db using main program at the same time through our through our handle request which is nothing but a lambda function and what we are doing is we are trying to get a after persisting the data we are trying to get a response also saying that saved the record without any issues and successfully that's what this program is trying to do it okay so let's quickly jump onto dynamo db and try to explore more in terms of what exactly is the dynamo db so this is a dynamo db uh, console you can search it from here uh, uh, dynamo db it will take you manage a nosql database okay it will bring you to this screen create a table we wanted to create a table by name person with id and if you would have noticed i have created an id of type number in the program i am expecting this to be a type of number basically set id i'm not using it as a string if i would have been using it as a string i would have done it kept it in the table designing also in the similar way okay and i'm i'm handling it as a no numeric number see, since you can see that it is an integration so now if i go back here let's try to create a table with default settings okay default setting means no secondary indices indexes and uh, provisioned capacity is set to five reads and five writes so it, again this is uh, no no sql database which is offered by aws and which is open uh, means which we can access this to over the internet also okay. and or you can make it more secure also so we create let's create it simplistically then we will revisit it uh, some of its uh, attributes actually so now that this table is created it has some more features actually which you can enable it like recovery time encryption since it is uh, exposed okay uh, over the internet it is accessible so you can there are a lot more settings but for our purpose uh, um, we are not trying to do uh, much here all we are trying to do it is uh, created a person table with an primary key 
as an id okay rest we will see the as we progress now we have in this account we have created a person table let's try to insert it some data from our program basically okay so in this program what we are trying to do is we are trying to run it as a main program and trying to see whether we can push it the data into dynamo db okay so let's see whether it successfully looks like that it successfully inserted the data what happens is you know, i'm trying to print the data what we am pushing it and looks like it printed it uh, sorry it saved it and uh, that's what we got a response actually so set message this is something we are not seeing it which we will see it in the dynamo db uh, sorry when we will go for our lambda function implementation so let's quickly go to our table and see if data came here and here you go your data successfully landed into the dynamo db and you can see that everything is here right so now you have tested your application uh, that it works now we wanted to deploy the same thing into lambda let's upload the function do you want it to over we can overload also the same function okay but this time we are telling that this will uh, this will be using as a this handler but not this handler okay so we can go for this handler okay in the east region next it is pushing our program we wanted to use this s3 bucket my this is my this is my dynamo db lambda function let's finish it let's see whether it uploaded or not go to the console go to the lambda and let's see whether it uploaded or not 11 seconds ago so we can we are sure that it is our program and this was the description which i gave it so now here what we are doing is in this function is we are telling that this is the handler while in the earlier program we had a different handler so now this program expects us to pass this object to the handle request okay and this object is nothing but a a request which is coming from your uh, test program where you will be pushing id first name last name age and address to this uh, into this object and that object will push that data into dynamo db so let's see how far we can go with this <laughs> so let's configure a new test event hello world now you can see that i have already created one event okay with uh, these details saved it and let's try to test it out like we did it last time now so what did happen it is saying that this role does not have a is not authorized to perform this action so we did one mistake actually when we promoted this program into aws we chose the wrong security group let's see my hello function next then here we chose the wrong i am role which we wanted to choose it here so let's deploy it once again let's go back here 
let's refresh it and let's see whether our program 13 seconds deployed let's test it out one second executing the function hopefully this time it will run we can go and check into dynamo db it doesn't it does not look like it inserted the data okay my hello function is not authorized to perform dynamo db that is another problem because when we created this user we did not roll we did not give permissions other than um, other than lambda so let's give the permissions to this more than uh, what we have initially thought about it so let's go to IAM lambda basic execution rule attach policies here we will attach the policies related to lambda let's for now let's give the lambda full access but again it's a based on uh, your need you can specify what exactly you wanted to do it now we have attached the policy to this role which is a simply lambda role i hope we have saved it hopefully we should be good let's test it out once more and here we go we have successfully saved the record without any issues and successfully and let's see whether it updated in dynamo tv to india 12 anything apart so now you have learned how to test your function locally from your uh, eclipse you know how to test your function by making a connection to the dynamo db uh, push the data from your sample program using a unit test case now in the next chapter we will see how to do uh, how to expose this um, apis through api gateway so till then stay tuned and uh, let's let's see so so far we have seen integrating your lambda function with dynamo db standalone running of pro dynamo db um, as well as unit testing into AWS console itself, uh, your program, you have done it. Now what you wanted to do it is, we wanted to expose this service to the external world and in a secure way, that also in a secure way we wanted to do it. So what we are going to do it is, we are going to make use of API gateway. So, so let's get started. What exactly is the API gateway? And how to integrate it with uh, um, AWS um, Lambda. So as I said, we will be learning how to integrate with AWS Lambda. How to call the method from API Gateway. AWS Lambda method. Let's search for API Gateway. API Gateway screen some, looks like something like this and what we will try to do here is we try to build a rest api new api we'll try to build is save for some detail test regional you can have it available as an age optimizer also or you can make it a regional also 
create an API. Okay. You wanted to create a method also you wanted to create. So what we are going to do is post basically. We are trying to integrate it with lambda function. Our lambda function, if you type it here, should come my hello function. Save it. Okay. This is giving the permission. Give. And here we have integrated with our lambda function. So let's go back to lambda and try to copy the call. Let's say calling JSON object. I don't want it to rewrite it. Let's go to the API gateway. Let's test it out. Request body. Come on. Here, this time we will have it three. We will test it out and see whether it is working or not. Post. Yep, we have saved the record without any issues which is the third record we saved it, okay? So now we have integrated with API Gateway also. Now what we have done so far is we have done the integration. Now we wanted to deploy it, okay? Deploy this API so that we have a nice beautiful URL. Prod. Prod. I'm just, so I'm just giving the stage name where it is getting deployed. Okay. So now it gave me a nice URL. I, this URL, I can call it from anywhere. If I want to protect it, I can protect uh, this URL also from wherever it is getting called. At the same time, I can make sure that it is somebody is not misusing it or sending a huge number of data so i can throttle also around it i can burst request i can number of requests it can accept in short period of time that also i am specifying it if you see now i have a infinite capacity okay for my program i can push as much data i want it because my DynamoDB is also scalable as well as my Lambda function is also scalable. I'm not going to go into each one of this setting, but again, if you want, you can go ahead and test it out. So there are, this is something I wanted to show you, throttling and all. Again, you can create the API keys for your security purpose. Usage plan, you can give it for multiple clients. If you wanted to have this, uh, service used by four or five uh, teams and you wanted to see who is using more you can track it also or you wanted to give some licensing like 100 requests after that we will tie um, we will not be accepting any of your request you need to request us uh, that uh, more licenses are needed or more number of executions uh, we need it so that all you can configure it through api gateway so so now you have a nice API gateway URL also. You have, you can store the data also, okay. If uh, this is a post request, so I can directly go and uh, test it out in the browser because it is gonna say that missing authentication token. So you can test it through any one of the, um, any uh, like SOAP UI or anything, it is a REST have a json object created the way i have showed you and test it out so and you can push the data as much as you want it so now we have covered the api gateway also so let's see in the next chapter about what are the disadvantage of uh, what are the i mean shortcomings not disadvantage i will say that shortcomings are which lambda function has it and and i will try to 
Well, we'll try to go through each one of them and later we will see at the end as a billing reports. Now let us try to come to our last topic, last two topics, which are kind of bonus topics, uh, which I have added later, is about uh, shortcomings of serverless architecture. As um, so far you have seen that it has how quickly you can go into um, Lambda as well as DynamoDB, start pushing your data and make that service available over the internet also. So you have seen all those uh, actually integration points as well as how quickly we made it available over the internet. And it has a lot of advantages also because um, um, you, you have unit tested, deployed, which is not that much easy on any platform or anywhere we try to do it. But if there are so many advantages, one can ask why not everybody started implementing it. There are certain use cases for which it is not suggestible and there are certain um, shortcomings uh, serverless architecture also has. It. I kept that as shortcomings as a serverless architecture because it applies it uh, no matter which vendor uh, you go for. So these are because the architecture it is residing on, um, it has certain, um, I must say that there are certain shortcomings which uh, you will see everywhere. First is uh, vendor control. As you can see that uh, there are very limited options which we can do it into the serverless architecture. Uh, in the lambda actually in aws which we have seen it like um, what languages we can select what version we can select so there are limited um, limited uh, um, versions available we can't just go for any version and try to deploy it so most of the control is under uh, with vendor loss of server optimization okay um, as you can see that uh, there is nothing we can do much uh, for your program like if you try to improve its, its performance or any optimization you are trying to do it you really don't have a control on it execution duration this is uh, something it it varies from time to time okay if you have observed it you try running your program multiple times on a gap of like 5 to 10 minutes you will observe that the the execution duration is different okay and uh, if after a gap if you try to run it there is a latency also that is called startup latency as i mentioned very initially that um, not all the um, aws um, lambda which you try to implement is all the time it is running okay it runs as and when you there are certain requests comes on to that their way okay so how it works basically is first request when it comes it keeps running that server for some time or that container for some time so that consecutive requests are served uh, without building the container okay but if you give certain time basically like 10 minutes or 20 minutes if you give and you try to execute it uh, you will see that um, first request is taking time okay so why it is taking time is because it is taking the data from s3 bucket uh, data in the sense your program trying to find a container and deploy it onto it so that makes it a little bit of uh, difficult uh, for certain initial request okay if you are running a large programs uh, then you might um, you might experience it um, um, miss, miss, you, it will be so obvious for you so that is an, another problem debugging so you have uh, the debugging uh, is a um, little bit limited as you have seen it like if you would be doing it on your EC2 uh, deployment or anywhere else, 
you would have went to the console and just started printing some of the statements and started looking at it you debugging it's it takes little bit of time okay monitoring and observe observability okay so since this is uh, entirely under vendor vendor um, which your cloud vendor uh, you went for uh, so it takes it's a little bit of difficult to monitor um, how our program is performing is there any memory loss is there okay like uh, um, any objects are consuming more memory okay so the, those things uh, we won't be able to find out very easily in the um, at least wherever you see the serverless implementation so these are the some of the shortcomings and uh, when you're designing any solution considering the lambda function or serverless architecture you need to consider this that uh, these will be your limitations and if you wanted to if you feel that you're not comfortable with this uh, limitations then uh, i i will suggest that uh, lambda function is not the perfect candidate for you so so let's meet in next chapter where we will try to see how the paper compute works actually so stay tuned so this is the last topic guys so in this topic what we will try to understand is why it is so cheap and how it is the calculation is done basically so this is from aws actually okay what it says is if you have a program of 512 mb uh, which is executed 3 million times in one month and it ran for one second each time your charges will be calculated as follows so basically these are the things um, you need to consider when your program is running um, when you are deploying it onto lambda first is what is the memory allocated how many number of requests and how much time it is running okay i know that latency is there for the startup but that is you are paying for it okay so your monthly charges are like these this is per um i'll say per gbs um and the, the free trier has some 4000 um, gbs actually that's how they calculate it okay so total compute is 3 million uh, requests are there into one second uh, which is uh, the one execution cost around which comes to around uh, 3 million seconds okay and total compute is in gbs okay gbs is nothing but how many executions per uh, gb okay so you have seen 512 is converted into gb okay and 3000 uh, seconds are there you are multiplying one five uh, zero 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 gbs is your total compute so you have every every month they give you during free tier these many number of requests actually so here we are subtracting it and uh, you are paying for this much only basically free tier is after after your uh, free tier is gone you're paying for this much which comes the cost wise is totally 18 dollar if you are running with uh, some application of this size for this much uh, it's a 3 million okay gbs is like uh, kind of their way of compute gb memory how many seconds basically that is going to run so that's how the entire cost is calculated so you can see that if some application you wanted to launch for a 3 million request what kind of infrastructure you need it okay and uh, how cheap it is so that's why it is quite popular and if you wanted to run something ad hoc or some batch processing 
I don't see why not actually any function as a service you can implement into Lambda and it's a very much cost effective and uh, I don't see anybody why anybody should not go for it but again consider those limitations and think on it so with that thank you very much and uh, please um, if you guys have any questions please feel free to uh, put it um, on uh, in the comment section so that i can go through it and uh, i can start answering it also and uh, if anybody wants to reach out to me uh, you can visit my website also uh, which i already told http w uh, at the same time you guys can visit me on linkedin also in case of any questions so thank you very much and uh, please uh, do leave a uh, feedback i'm most of the time i try to give these courses at uh, without any charges so to just to improve myself and spread the knowledge across um, across the community which i have learned today now uh, which i would have learned it in a difficult way but i believe in spreading the knowledge so please go ahead and uh, subscribe leave a comment and uh, tell me what i can improve more so with that thank you very much hello friends welcome to another topic at learn it in five minutes today we are going to talk about what is blue green deployment all right let us try to understand what is a blue green deployment in detail so typically when you have a web based application you configure your dns for example, consider you wanted to update this web website www.sachinkapaya.com, which uh, typically routes the traffic to through the load balancer to one set of stack with a particular version. Okay, when I say stack, it consists of uh, application release version 1.0, app server is of version 1, and database server is of uh, uh, version 1. For this set of uh, for this release of application so when you wanted to do any new release basically and you wanted to publish a new set of functionality to your end user typically what you do is you make those updates to the existing environment like you do the release okay uh, 1.1 app server you are upgrading it here it is like two and uh, database you are updating it to 1.1 and during this entire period what you do it is you disconnect the traffic coming into the system while you are doing all these activities and users are either shown a sorry page saying that mm, sorry you can't come into the system we have a downtime so this is how typical releases works this is how typically you do your all your release um, app server upgrades database server upgrades so that's the model um, most of the places you are following up but what exactly different happens in the blue green deployment in the blue green deployment whatever upgrades you wanted to make you stand up a parallel environment you stand up a parallel environment with whatever set of um, updates you need it like release 1.1 app server 2 database 1.1 and and once the environment is stood up what you do is you test it out this environment okay you can test it out standalone on a on a different url which is the internal which is not published to the end users okay and once that verification is done you connect that the url or you configure as a pool for your load balancer and you start sending the traffic to this uh, newly created stack and slowly what you do once it is verified everything is fine 
you do is you start disconnecting this um, blue environment from your load balancer so during entire this process the end user never gets affected they they don't even notice that they are continue to use this url and they continues to continues to um, basically access this website without any issues and they don't realize that their uh, entire traffic is routed from earlier version to the new version the only advantage of this approach is um, your end users are never impacted there is zero downtime basically and uh, there is uh, no possibility of going anything wrong um because you are already standing up the environment and you are testing it out so that's the biggest advantage the only disadvantage you are parallelly standing up the two environments for a certain period of time of your testing that's the only disadvantage in the blue green deployment otherwise it's a it's a very well proven model if you have a um infrastructure which is elastic enough to have you can stand up a parallel environment for some time um then that will be this will be your best approach and uh, this is how you should be releasing your application so thank you very much and please do let me know in case of uh, any more question and please subscribe to uh, my channel learn it in less than five minutes so that